put your main standing, and then let's pray together. Lord, we love being able to worship you and to sing praises about how our praise will actually change and be something different once you've glorified us, when we see you face to face, when we are and we've left sin behind be, simply because you will have glorified us and made us like your son. Lord, we love to think about his arrival, Christ, who is our life. When he appears, our life will appear also with him. And uh, Lord, when he, when, Lord Jesus Christ, when you show up, we will see you as you are and we will become like you. Lord, we love to think about how our praise will finally be something at least even in perfection it still won't rival your worthiness but it at least will be free of the error and the flaw it'll be free of the sin that remains we long for you to have the worship that you so richly deserve and yet lord at the same time here we are a group of sinners made saints Sinners who've been redeemed and made new. We are not what we used to be, but we are not yet what we will be. And we, we sit here uh, and sing your praises, and, and we know that you actually have more glory to get from us, even here and now, before we're glorified, than you would if you just glorified us all right now. You certainly have the capability to do that, and, and we long for that day, but as long as you tarry, Lord... We know that you also, in a different way, get more glory for your name by producing for yourself a flawed worship among a people that still live in the midst of the world. We still live in a cursed earth. We still live in the echo of our old men, our sinful nature still, still remains it's not in control, it's not in dominion, but it still remains. And here we are, longing for you to get glory in this state, thankful for the opportunity to praise you. And Lord, we know that um, perhaps the greatest way we can praise you is to worship you in your word and to submit our hearts to you. And we want to direct our attention to your truth now. We ask that as a church, you, you would just give us corporately a, uh, what you've done so often corporately a positive response a soft heart give us a soft heart to truth and we would see the glory of your gospel and the glory of truth in this story that you've recorded for us in the gospel of mark and so we turn our attention to it asking for help to believe to submit that it, the implications would be traced out even as we we think about our lives help us to live this truth lord for your glory and your glory alone in your name we pray amen uh, you may grab a, take your seat. I want to ask you to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. As you're making your way to this first narrative in Mark chapter 3, I, I just want to start by telling you a little anecdote about my life early on in ministry. I remember um, hearing a um, a pastor tell me that uh, when it comes to ministry, it's important to be known for being for what you're for, not to be known for what you're against. And I remember hearing that statement and thinking, okay, that's an axiom that you should, uh, you should build a life off of. Don't be known for being against something. Be known for being for something. And uh, lo and behold, it became pretty impossible to live that out. I suddenly uh, found that axiom to be a little, bit, a little bit lacking, and I thought, man, this just doesn't work to only be known for what you're for and to not be known for what you're against. And so I remember um, asking a, a pastor about, man, how do you think about this, the, the, the antithesis and the tension between what you're for and what you're against? And uh, he simply summarized it by saying, why wouldn't we just say be known for being for what the Bible's for and against what the Bible's against. I thought that was it. That's the biblical antithesis. 
That's the biblical tension right there. And lo and behold, when you read your scripture, you can't help but notice there is a, uh, an antithesis built into the very fabric of scripture, an antithesis. There's, a, there's contradiction, there's opposites, and those two must be held in proper balance. Let me give you a few examples just by way of illustration. In Psalm 119, in the Mem stanza, listen to how this stanza begins with the positive. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. But imagine saying that you're, you're going to love God's law, but you're not going to hate anything that's opposed to God's law. And no, no doubt, by the end of the stanza, the psalmist brings a, a, some more balance and says, from your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. It would be right and biblical to say that we can't say we love God's law if we don't hate every false way, and we can't say we hate every false way if we don't love God's law. The antithesis has to be held in balance. Uh, similarly, we, uh, we live in a culture where, you, as you drive down the, the, the freeway, we're reminded that love is love. And the question is, well, what does that even mean? And God tells us what love is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And listen to the definition of love, and listen to the positives and the negatives. In, verse, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 um, and following, it says, love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And so you've got a couple positives followed by a handful of negatives, and then it concludes with about six more positives. It's, 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 it's this, and it's not this. It's not this. It is this. And this antithesis is all the way through the scriptures. And we even think about the Christian life. It becomes obvious to illustrate that. The Apostle Paul doesn't just say, put off and go on your merry way. He says, put off and put on. <laughs> uh, there's not just the avoidance of the negative. It's the positive production of the Spirit producing what's, what's right and holy and true in the life of a believer that is the proper balance. But let me get even a little bit more specific. The scriptures are, when I say that the scriptures have this fabric of antithesis, there, there is a hostility and a tension that exists in the very fabric of creation ever since the curse. Mankind was created upright, but we sought out various devices. Since the fall of man, according to the curse of God, there is enmity, hostility, animosity between what's fallen and what God created. There's the animosity between sinful man and, and righteous God. There's, there's hostility and enmity and warfare between those who are in error and, and God who is the truth. In Genesis 3.15, in the, it's called the Proto-Evangelium. It's the first articulation of the gospel. And God says he's going to um, produce hostility between the seed of Satan and the seed of the woman, and there's going to be an animosity between them, hostility. And that hostility pervades to this very day. There's an antithesis that exists in creation between truth and error. They are categorical opposites. They do not mix. They are in, you cannot, you cannot um, uh, mix them together. There's no harmony. There's no sympathy between the two. We are diving into a story in Mark chapter 3 that highlights this antithesis, and it shows the, the hostility and the animosity uh, between truth and error. This is really what Mark describes for us is a, a story that highlights the theological fact that Paul describes in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes this. He says that those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Listen to this. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. 
for it does not subject itself to the law of God. The statement of fact is the fleshly mindset is hostile to God. It's not neutral toward God. It's not indifferent toward God. It doesn't put up with God. It hates God. It hates truth. It hates everything that exposes its own error. Why is that the case, Paul? Because that's the case, because the mindset in the flesh does not subject itself to the law of God. It doesn't come under the law of God. So apart from coming under the law of God, that is called hostility. A refusal to come under truth, a refusal to submit to truth, is hostility to the truth. There's no fence riding. There's no ambivalence. There's no neutrality. Every human being is either in love with the truth or hostile to the truth. It's patently black and white. And then Paul goes on to explain it this way. It does not even subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. In our hostility to the truth, we lack the ability to even submit ourselves to the law of God. And then verse 8, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is a dark picture. The antithesis between truth and error indicts us all. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so we are all under the, in the crosshairs of this uh, indictment. Truth comes into the world and exposes light and shines light on a very dark landscape. Our only hope is the truth. And the irony of it is, the brighter the truth shines on those who are hostile to the truth, the more strong, the more opposite of the reaction against that light. The hatred of the light is manifested as stronger and stronger and stronger to the degree that you turn up the dimmer switch on the truth being shined and the truth that's being exposed. And that's exactly what we see in Mark chapter 3. I want to start by just reading this story. I'm going to ask you to follow along with me. And, and we have to do some uh, review work this morning because this, this story is, is really the end of a long series of controversies that have been building. And so to really appreciate what Mark is doing, I'm going to do a bit of a review here. But before we do that, let's read the story. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1, Mark writes, He entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. To, to more fully appreciate what Mark is doing here in the story, we need to remember that this is the last of five controversy narratives. This started in chapter 2, verse 1. It goes all the way to chapter 3, verse 6. And so let me just go back and make some observations about these texts that we've looked at over the last several months. To begin with, you remember back in chapter 1 that Mark was documenting that Jesus, after John was imprisoned, picks up in this preaching ministry. He's preaching in chapter 1, verse 14. He's preaching throughout all of chapter 1, all the way through chapter 3, as we see. In chapter 1, verse 38, Mark even records Jesus as saying, let's go somewhere else so that I can preach there also, for that is what I came for. I mean, he is involved in a preaching ministry. He's preaching the truth, teaching the truth, and his teaching and preaching of the truth is so powerful that it's more memorable than the miracles that he's performing. It's more memorable than casting out demons. It's more memorable than healing the sick. It's more memorable than raising the dead. That is some powerful preaching. He came to preach truth. Truth is on display by Jesus' preaching ministry. And, as you know, truth is on display by Jesus walking the earth. 
Listen, it's not just true what Jesus says. You or I, we, we might be able to say something that's true to the degree that it correlates with the reality that Christ has given us in his word. It's true. When Christ speaks, it's the truth. It's not just, it doesn't just happen to be true because it correlates to a standard of truth. It is the standard of truth. And Jesus came and he says, I am the truth. His preaching is the truth. His person is the truth. What he says and what he does is the truth. And that's his ministry. And he comes to do that. And then you get to the end of chapter 1, and now I want to start highlighting some details that we haven't really had the time to do because we've been moving through this, this narrative so quickly. But you remember several, maybe months ago now at this point, chapter 1, verse 45, he goes out, and uh, this, this man, this is the leper who was healed in verses 40 to 44, he goes out and begins to proclaim it freely and spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. So the bad press, the bad publicity from this man who was healed, whom he said, don't tell anyone. He goes out and blabs the, the bad publicity. He blabs it to everyone. It prevents him from going out to preach in populated areas. It's actually a hindrance to his preaching ministry. This is the primary purpose of his coming, is to preach. You pick it up in verse chapter 2, verse 1, it just says, when he came back to Capernaum. So it just picks up the story, and he's back in a populated area, and he's continuing to teach. And so there he is in this house, likely Simon Peter's um, mother, um, his, Simon Peter's house, and, um, and he's, he's teaching. He was speaking the word to them, verse 2. So he's back in populated areas teaching. It doesn't quite fit. And you remember, as we've said, Mark is not a chronological gospel. It's a thematic gospel. Mark is doing something here that's very important for us to pick up on and recognize what he's doing thematically. The, the, the story of 145 kind of picks up again in chapter 3, verse 7. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples. And so now you have him withdrawing away from populated areas. Oh, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? Chapter 1, verse 45, he had to withdraw from populated areas. And then chapter 3, verse 7 records what happens when they withdrew from populated areas. So what's going on between? What happened in chapter 2, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 6? And this is the first section of this, of this rich gospel, and Mark is documenting the unbelief of the religious leaders. The refrain comes in verse 5, Chapter 3, verse 5, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he says to them, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And then the Pharisees go out and conspire how they can kill him. The hostility has reached its climax. It's reached its pinnacle here in the story that we are in. And this becomes a refrain for the whole first section of the gospel. You can see the unbelief of the people, documented in chapter 6, verse 6, just simply says, he, Jesus, wondered at their unbelief. Everyone else is walking around wondering, amazed at Jesus because of his greatness. He, in return, is wondering, amazed at their unbelief. Chapter 8, verses 17 to 21, becomes a refrain that documents, you know what? The disciples themselves are struggling to, degree, to a degree with unbelief and hardness of heart. Chapter 8, verse 17, Jesus said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that we have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Verse 21, he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? Similar, that, that, that refrain is going to be documented throughout, including uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 52, where Jesus, after um, feeding the 5,000 and then walking on the water, it says that he's utterly astonished, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the disciples are utterly astonished that he calms the wind, but explains why they were astonished because they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves but their heart was hardened and so mark is documenting unbelief and hardness of heart categorically throughout this entire first eight chapters of this gospel what is mark doing from 2 1 to 3 6 he's documenting specifically in response to jesus's teaching ministry and in response to his personal actions hostility toward the truth the hostility that's documented in these five stories is structured quite interestingly. And the first story, if you remember, it goes from chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 12, and that's the paralytic who's healed. 
He's teaching. They bring in the paralytic. He heals him. They drop him through the roof. You remember that. Um, and then the, 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 the last story, this story that we're looking at this morning, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, it also involves a healing. So the first and last story in are healing miracles. Similarly, the second and fourth story are also parallel. And if you look at verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13 to chapter 2, verse 17, you remember in this story, this is when he's feasting and they are concerned about Jesus eating with sinners and associating with worldly people. And this is a story about eating. You look at last week's text from chapter 2, verse 23 to 28, and that's also a story about eating. His disciples are eating grain on the Sabbath, and the uh, religious leaders are indicting them for eating on the Sabbath, eating this grain as they're walking along. The middle story from chapter 2, verse 18 to 22, is about fasting, not eating. And the way that the, the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees are, are fasting is categorically opposite to Jesus' disciples who are eating and just enjoying a meal while Jesus is with them. And he's pointing out that, you know what, you're trying to mix religions here. You're, you're creating a syncretistic approach to religion. That'll never work. And so this is a story, it's in a, in a chiastic structure of hostility. There's a couple more things I want to point out. This opposition also increase, increases in a couple of ways. First of all, it increases by who is demonstrated as being a part of the hostility. Uh, and number two, it increases in the volume, if you will, the volume of the hostility expressed. Let's look at who, who's described as being the ones who are hostile. Chapter 2, verse 6, it just simply says, some scribes are sitting there. Chapter 2, verse 6, just some scribes. Then in verse in the second story, uh, in verse 16, uh, the, the, the label on those who are hostile to Christ is specifically the scribes of the Pharisees. Then in verse 18, it's John's disciples and the Pharisees, and whether that's John's disciples who were only John's disciples and refused to follow Christ, or if that's just some who are not quite caught up to speed, we talked about that in that story, but it's John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees. And then in verse, um, uh, in verse 24, it's the Pharisees themselves. The Pharisees are saying, and now in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, it's the Pharisees and the Herodians together. Not only are the players in, developed in increasing hostility closer and closer to the core of the leadership, so is the volume. Go back to chapter 2, verse Verse um, 6, the scribes are sitting there and they're reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. They're accusing Jesus of blaspheming in their heart. It's internal. It's, it's, it's not even expressed audibly. It's not shared with their neighbor. It's not shared in secret places. It is literally just a thought, an internal monologue. And Jesus picks it up and has a conversation with their internal monologue and just exposes them publicly. In chapter 2, um, next story, in verse 16, it says that the scribes of the Pharisees, they saw he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors. They said to his disciples. So now it becomes expressed, but they don't, they don't go directly at Jesus. They do an end around. They go to his disciples. They don't want to talk to Jesus directly. They just say, okay, let's, just, let's, just, let's undermine him. Let's talk to his disciples. And they start asking them questions. Why is, why is Jesus doing this? In the third story... They approach Jesus under the guise of an honest question. Notice these disciples of the, of, of the Pharisees, um, they're all fasting, and they come to him and say, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And whether that's the disciples of the Pharisees asking the question, more likely it's just the people asking in light of the difference, it now becomes a question that Jesus takes that question and starts to expose the nature of the hostility. And this is a syncretism of man-made religion and God-given religion. In the fourth story, it's still a question, but it's not an honest question. After the, they see the disciples walking along the way with Jesus and they're they're picking the heads of the grain, eating on the Sabbath. The Pharisees are saying in verse 24, they're saying to him directly, so it's directly to Jesus now. And the question is not an honest question. It is flat out a rebuke. Look, 
Why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? It's a flat-out confrontation. By the time we get to our story, this volume of hostility has increased to the point that in verse 2, it says they were watching him. They're scoping him out. They are on the prowl. These religious leaders are checking out Jesus, watching his every move, scrutinizing him, and he is okay being under the magnifying glass because he is the truth. He has nothing to hide. He's under their magnifying glass, and they are scrutinizing every single move to see so that they could accuse him, verse 2. Obviously, it reaches a climax in verse 6 because they plot his murder. They start making secret counsel together, meeting in, in private locations to try to figure out how can we kill Christ. This is the climax of the hostility. We're going we're to dive into the story, and as we watch Jesus work, we're going to see a couple things about the truth. We're going to see how truth provokes and how it polarizes. Let's pick it up in verse 1. He enters again into a synagogue, and that's exactly a word for word um, the inter, he enters in again, uh, the verb and the prepositional phrase there, minus, minus the synagogue. The same way he began chapter 2, verse 1, the very original healing story of the healing of the paralytic. And so he bookends these stories, not only just with the fact that they're healing, but actually with the very verbiage that he uses to introduce the story. He goes into a synagogue. As we know from the parallel, Luke chapter 6, verse 6, he was teaching in the synagogue. And of course, that's no surprise to us because he's teaching everywhere he goes. And so here he is, he's in the synagogue, he's on the Sabbath, and he is teaching. Mark gives us the background we need to see this showdown happen. This really is a showdown. Two, major, two minor players, Jesus is the major player, but the two minor players is this man who, is, who has a withered hand. And this word withered hand, it does not mean that he needs lotion. The term withered could sound like something pertaining to the skin. It's not, it's, it's having to do with his, its functionality. In fact, the, the word really would be used of plants. If a plant had no water and it, was, it would wither, and obviously you, you understand what happens to a plant when it withers. And so that's appropriate translation when you're talking about a plant without water. But it metaphorically would mean um, lame, crippled, or paralyzed. And so paralyzed would be a great metaphorical translation of this word. It's, it's a withered hand. It's a paralyzed hand. He has lost the function of this hand. This is a debilitating injury. It would have limited how this man could have made a living, how he could have provided for his family. In a agrarian culture, agricultural culture, it would be very limiting as to what scope of work you could do. And so here he is. He's on the Sabbath, sitting, listening to this teaching. And he's just in the audience, just hearing Jesus teach. Verse 2 gives us the background on the other party here. And this is the party where the showdown happens. Jesus versus the they of verse 2. They were watching him, scoping him out, scrutinizing him, looking at his every move in order to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. I wonder if he's going to heal on the Sabbath. He's been healing a lot. It's kind of like it just, I don't know why, it's just like natural for him. He does it all the time. This guy is so merciful and compassionate, it makes me sick. I wonder if he's going to do it on the Sabbath. You know, if we can catch this guy, we can indict him for being merciful on the Sabbath. Man, we'll have him where we want him. Why? So that they can accuse him. They're trying to put him in the crosshairs as guilty of their scruples. They operate in a world, as we've looked at, that is a man-made religion. It has nothing to do with the truth. It has everything to do with worship of self. You know, they've started with truth. They've twisted it, turned it into a lie. They've made it into a focus of religion where they are the gatekeepers. They hold the keys. Everyone has to worship the way that they worship. It is so harmful and so detrimental to everyone under that system, including this man with the withered hand. And by the way, isn't that, we talked about this last week, but it just bears repeating, isn't that always the case? We have truth revealed in Scripture, and it bears 
unimprovable testimony to the glory of God. Man puts our grubby fingerprints all over it, and we drag down the glory of God. And the truth revealed in Scripture is the spiritual best for mankind. And we mess it up, we foul it up, and we make it hurtful and harmful, and people suffer when divine revelation gets tampered with. And here's a case in point. So having finished the background in 1B in verse 2, Mark picks up the story and just says, he says to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. Now, what's interesting about that is, um, you know, this, this get up and come forward would literally, here's what the Greek ear would hear when Jesus says that. It's literally rise to the middle, rise to the middle, but we don't, we don't talk that way. And so yeah, this is a really good translation. It's, it's, it includes a command to get up and it includes the location of get here in the middle. The point is, is that he's just saying, you know, rise to the middle, get over here. And he puts this man with a withered hand in, in a central location. It's as if, you know, Jesus obviously knows he's being scrutinized. He knows he's being scrutinized. They're watching his every single move, and he's just like, in case there's anyone who's checking me out who's, you know, legally blind, we're going to put him in the center. Let's just go ahead and make a showcase out of this whole ordeal. I mean, it's, it's unmistakable. Jesus is provoking the issue here. He's not doing it in an unkind way. He's not doing it out of a lack of love. He, he, he's actually, this is the, one of the most loving things Jesus could do to these religious leaders who are worshiping themselves, thinking they are worshiping God in Torah. He's exposing the, 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 the self-worship of their religion. He's exposing the, the fraudulency of it. He is provoking. He's going to show the manifestation. He's bringing to the front the hostility that rests in the heart of these worshipers, and he's going to show exactly how strong that hostility is, and it's actually quite a grace. Before we, before we get into what happens when he has this man get up and come forward and make him center place, it, I, know, I, I know as you're hearing this story, it could be quite shocking to think, man, that's the Lord is provoking He's provoking this clash between truth and error? Yeah. He's flat out provoking the clash between truth and error. To appreciate that rightly, think about this. Our Lord, if he were interested in leaving these religious leaders in their sin, he never had to provoke them. All he has to do is do nothing. He is so loving that he will provoke sinners with truth so that they can see the hostility that is intrinsic to their heart that they would not see apart from the manifestation of the truth. So as we work through this story, don't hear this and think, oh, wow, Jesus is, is somehow setting this example for me just to be pugnacious and for me to hate people. It's not at all what he's doing. He's not hating anyone. He is provoking a hostile response to the truth because it's already there in their heart. And so what happens? He says to this man with a withered hand, as he's wrapping up his Shabbat sermon, he sees him sitting there, and he just says, rise to the middle, <laughs> puts him front and center. Verse 4, he said to them, now he's speaking to everyone there, plural, to all the audience, poses this question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save, or, uh, to save a life or to kill? Now, this is a mouthful. This is a profound question. There's a lot going on here. We've got to slow down on this question because this is really, really critical. First of all, you have to remember, what does Jesus mean when he says lawful? Is it lawful? Is he saying, is it biblical? Uh, no, he's actually saying, is it lawful according to your Shabbat practices? And remember, that's how he's used it, because he's using it how they're using it. Remember last week, chapter 2, verse um, 24, 
the Pharisees look at Jesus and say, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, they're not violating the Old Testament uh, scriptures. They're not violating what God has told them to do or not do on the Sabbath. They're violating Pharisaical interpretation of how you honor the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, and keep it holy. And so here, um, they use it in the sense of don't violate our scruples, don't violate our legalism. Then Jesus picks up the word. And he says in verse 26, when David ate the bread, they're eating something which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he also gave it to those who were with him. He's pointing out that according to Pharisaical interpretation, David would be indicted for not keeping the Sabbath. Interestingly enough, as we mentioned last week, just by way of quick way of review, in the parallel, Matthew chapter 12, there's another, there's another point added that Matthew records. He records that, uh, Matthew records that Jesus actually said, not only did the Pharisaical interpretation condemn David, Pharisaical interpretation condemns the Levites, the, the priests that carry out weekly function, weekly worship. And then to simply obey the book of Leviticus requires them to disobey Pharisaical interpretation of Sabbath keeping. And if that wasn't enough, he says in chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, he points out that I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the one who created earth in six days. I rested on the seventh. If you really want to know what it means to keep the Sabbath, just watch me. Whatever I do is keeping the Sabbath. And so he's using this term lawful in the same way that they use the term lawful. So, verse 4, we'll come back to chapter 3, verse 4. Now we get to Jesus' question. Is it lawful? And he's asking them a penetrating question about their own belief system. He's exposing the error of their own belief system here. This is so, so important. Now, he, asked, he puts them on the horns of a dilemma because he gives them two options. You've got two options. What, what's lawful according to your interpretation of Shabbat? Is it to do good or to do harm? Is it to save a life or to kill? Now, to appreciate the tension here, I want to read to you, and this might feel like we're doing like weekly devotions in the Mishnah, uh, but that's just kind of like <laughs> necessary for where we're at. We're kind of necessary to understand this showdown between Jesus and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because the Mishnah is the, the earliest written record of the oral traditions that would have been commonplace among the, the rabbis and Pharisees that Jesus was actually discussing these things with. So let me read to you a verse out of a tractate called Yoma. That's just the Aramaic word for day. The Hebrew word is Yom. And it really is a tractate um, on, on the Day of Atonement, but it's in a section of the Mishnah on um, the, an order of festivals. So it's how to keep the festivals, the holy days, Sabbath, and sacrificial days, and all of the um, festive gatherings where people would come back to Jerusalem. In this tractate, Yoma, chapter 8, verse 6 says, Further did Rabbi Mattiah ben Harash say, He who has a pain in his throat, they drop medicine into his mouth on the Sabbath, because it is a matter of doubt as to danger to life. And any manner of doubt as to danger of life overrides the prohibitions of the Sabbath. This is a weighing in of a rule about how much medical help you are allowed to give on the Sabbath. And can I just, can I put a throat lozenge in there because I have a little tickle? Oh, no. He says, look, the issue here is dropping medicine into the mouth on the Sabbath because it's actually not sure what caused the sore throat, and is that something that's just a sign of something that could be fatal? So actually preventing that from spreading is saving life. So as long as it's saving life, you're exempt. You see, you see what he's saying? Jesus walks into that kind of mindset. I mean, that's what these guys believe. That's their practice. That's how they interpret it. And he walks into that environment, and now he has a man with a hand that is withered. And this is not life-threatening. I mean, I, I can't, we can't read between the lines. I don't know how long his hand has been hurt or injured or maimed. If he was born that way, he certainly does not have the use of it. It's crippled or paralyzed either by way of injury or birth defect. But Certainly, it seems like, you know, nobody's surprised by this, and certainly it wouldn't have been much of a miracle if he, you know, showed up with a fake bandage, and he'd been using it, you know, the day before, and then he just took off his bandage. Hey, yeah, check it out. I mean, this is a legit miracle. Everybody knows his hand is withered and ruined. It, it's not life-threatening. He's been living this way. We don't know how long, but he has been living with it. 
Jesus, let me be careful how I say this. Jesus would, in a human sense of saying it, he would have the ability, if he wanted to, to wait until Sunday morning. Let me just honor these scruples. Let me just wait till Sunday morning when the Sabbath is over, or even Saturday night, 6 p.m., after the sun goes down, just Saturday night. You could even do it then. Just wait. He is being a provocateur here. He's stimulating the manifestation of the resident hostility in the heart, heart of these sinners by asking this question. And the reason why I wanted to be careful about how I say Jesus could wait is because, of course, he's not going to wait because he's kind. He's good. And he has mercy and compassion on this man. He's not about to be merciless in order to some, fit into some scruple of some false, wicked religion. And so he puts them on the horns of this dilemma. Now we're ready to really appreciate the question about what's lawful. So, according to your interpretation, what should I do? Here's your two options. To do good, to save a life on the one hand, to do harm, to kill on the other. Well, how do you answer that? They have two options. <laughs> Either, yes, it's lawful to do good and save a life. Okay, if they say that, if they say, yes, it's good and lawful to, to help, to have mercy, to save life, to do what's good for people on the Sabbath, to minister to people on the Sabbath, to love your neighbor on the Sabbath. If they say, yes, that's good, then they just lost any criteria by which they can even condemn him. Worse, worse than the pragmatic effect is they would have to admit that their entire religion is wrong. Their entire religion is actually hurting and, and, and hindering people on the Sabbath. So they can't say, yes, it's lawful to do good and to save a life, because that exposes their entire system of rules that they've concocted and that oppress the worshipers of this pharisaical religion. So your other option. <laughs> What's your other option? Okay, can't say that. Uh, yes, it's lawful on the Sabbath to, according to verse 4, do harm or to kill. Ooh, <laughs> that's no good either. Because obviously that would expose the whole system as just being uh, satanic and full of hate. So they say the only thing they can say, nothing. Chapter, four, chapter 3, verse 4, B. But they kept silent. They have nothing they can say. They are pinned by the truth. And this is just how absurd it is to quarrel with the truth. This is how absurd it is to argue with the truth, to try to point, find blame with the truth. You always get pinned. And they are pinned right here by Jesus. And so verse 5 says, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he begins to speak to the man. Let's hold off on that for a second. Verse 5 is an interesting verse because here we have our Lord um, at his emotional finest. It's an intense recording of uh, tension and complexity. He's looking at them with anger. At the same time, he is grieved and moved over their hardness of heart. Let's take those one at a time. This word anger can be translated wrath. Jesus is looking around and there's this righteous wrath inside Jesus. Jesus never sinned. His wrath is always perfect. His wrath is always righteous. He's looking around at them. There's this anger and grief together over this hardness of heart. And before we come back and look at some more differences between anger and grief here, think about hardness of heart for a second. Hardness of heart. Why, why, he's looking at their hearts, and he sees their heart on display, and he sees them hating the truth. 
Hardness of heart is always a, a dis- display and demonstration of resistance to truth. When there's obstinacy, it's when a human heart won't comply to the truth. It won't come under the truth. It won't be reckoned with from the truth. There's hardness of heart there. There's no worse place to be than having a hard heart. Romans chapter 11, verse 7, Paul writes, What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. It's talking about an, an, a, a remnant of Israel. Even in Elijah's day, there were 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal. And so he says that's going to be true until Christ returns. There will always be a remnant. But the rest were hardened. In their unbelief, they were even hardened even farther to become less responsive to the truth, if that were possible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. On refusing to come to Christ, they continue in hardness because they cannot even see the meaning of the Old Testament Scriptures because they're committed by way of precursor from believing Christ. John chapter 12, verse 40 He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. I mean, that is a hardness of heart that John is quoting from Isaiah 6, saying there's a a resistance here, and God's even judicially hardening hearts uh, that are not responding to truth in the first place. Here is one of those stories. Here, Jesus has now encountered with sinners who have hardness of heart. They are not responding to truth. They are not responding to his teaching. They, they, they reject his teaching. They are trying to indict truth itself, capital T, truth, personified in Jesus Christ. He's looking at that, and he is angered and grieved at the same time. Isn't that sobering to think about Jesus' grief over hardness of heart? He's grieved by it. He's gripped by it. But why the anger? You know, the Gospel of Mark is going to be full of hardness of heart. <laughs> it's documented different people group of hardness of heart all the way through chapter 8, verse 21. And then from 8:22 all the way through chapter 10, it's going to be more of watching the, the disciples unravel their the degrees of hardness of heart in their own heart. And he's not constantly angry. He's occasionally angry. Why is Jesus angry in this occasion? Now you say, well, it doesn't say. That, it just says that after looking at them with anger. And so I don't want to, we can't, we would be, it would be uh, horribly dangerous to try to start making assumptions about the text when Mark's point is just documenting the fact that this anger exists in this story. But he does document anger elsewhere, and this is actually very helpful to, to notice. Um, let me show you one parallel that I think is helpful to even think about in chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. Turn over to chapter 10, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive you into the story of how Jesus, um, how Jesus blessed the children. He was so excited about ministering to the children. He wanted to bless them, pray for them, pray for their salvation. He wanted to care for them. Meanwhile, the disciples are so excited about the popularity of the new movement, and they hold the calendar. They're the gatekeepers to access to Jesus, and they're actually preventing um, children from coming to Christ. And so in chapter 10, verse 13, they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. The disciples start rebuking people for bringing their children to come see Jesus. And so we don't have time to develop the context here, but this is showing the selfish ambition of the disciples, and it's actually at odds with Jesus's purposes, and now it's affecting people around them. This is even worse. I mean, it's one thing for our sin to affect ourselves. Our sin affects the people around us. And Jesus saw this. He was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He was indignant. I mean, he's put up with so much from his disciples up to this point. Why is he indignant here? Because their sin would be keeping children from him. You go back to chapter 3, the same thing is true in this story. The sin and the perversion of the Pharisees is now keeping people from truth. It's hurting them not just by way of making their Sabbath experience miserable, 
but making their eternity miserable because they don't even have a gospel. They are rejecting the very promised one that their supposed scriptures pointed to. And so he is so righteous that he, he of course, is angry in this story, and that is a manifestation of his perfection. But he's also grieved. So he says to the man who's front and center, 5B, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Right there in the middle of the entire synagogue, everyone sees his hand restored to full function, capacity, flexibility, mobility, strength, perfect healing. This is done front and center. It's done on the Sabbath. It's done in such a way that is not a violation of the Torah in any way. I mean, let's just be honest. Three Greek words is hardly labor. Truth provokes. It provokes error. It provokes the hostility that is resident within. It makes that hostility manifest in such clear terms that it can actually be a grace for the person who is hostile. And Jesus has now provoked. And then in verse 6, not only does it provoke, it polarizes. Look what happens. In verse 6, the, the Pharisees go out and immediately begin conspiring with the Herodians against him as how, how they might destroy him. I mean, obviously, this is a, a, a back door, closed, closed room plot to murder Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is the two people involved, the Pharisees, a religious sect of rabbis and religious leaders. Uh, some of them could have been scribes, expert in the Old Testament. Some of them would have been um, synagogue leaders and rulers. They're conspiring with the Herodians. The Herodians, this is, King Herod is, is the, the, the uh, uh, king over Judea, and this is a political party. They're, they're, they're partisans of the Herodian party. And this is like, that's who, that's who ought to rule us, and we shouldn't have a Roman prefect. We prefer Herod, and so they're of the Herodian party. That's kind of like a political statement. So you have a religious group in the Pharisees, a political party in the Herodians, and what do they have in common? Hostility against the truth. That's what unites them. They're united in a common enemy. They hate the truth. You know, when you think about it, it's just interesting. If we, if we think about the, day, the, the, the age that we live in, if you think about what the world tells us, you know, there's many ways. Well, of course, you know that's not true. There's only one way to know anything. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one Christ, and there's only one way to worship him. There's only one true perspective on yourself. There's only one true anything. So if we included a true way of knowing, a true way of being saved, a true way of knowing Christ, and a true identity of Christ, if you include all those in the list, and you include all the false ways of knowing, all the false ways of being saved, you only have a list of two. It's either Christianity and everything else. It doesn't matter how long that list of superficial differences gets on the other side of being hostile to the truth. The truth polarizes and reminds us there's only two categories here. There's only two categories. You think about it, how do we know anything? There's only the Christian way of knowing something. Sinner graciously being given information from God so that he can get outside of his own selfish, sinful, interpretive world. Or every other way. Rationalism, empiricism, existentialism, whatever ism that we want on getting knowledge, it's just, it's just the Christian way and every other way. There's only two ways to know anything, right and wrong. <laughs> How many Christs are there? There's just two. One who revealed himself in Scripture and provided a way for sinners to be restored to their God and all the others. Truth polarizes. The Pharisees joined with the Herodians because of the common enemy. They both hate the truth. Jesus here is forcing the hand. He's provoking and polarizing all at once. You know, mankind is exposed to the truth in a couple of different ways. 
You know he's exposed to truth by way of general revelation in the form of creation all around us. And that shows us there is a God. He has eternal power and divine nature. We know that just simply from the creation. We also know that from our individual conscience. Every man has an individual conscience. It's a mechanism built into your soul, being created in the image of God that testifies at times saying you did it right, at times saying you did it wrong. You can sear it and you can malign it and you can miscalibrate it. But everyone is born with a conscience. And so by way of general revelation and conscience, everyone has a manifestation of truth. We are surrounded by truth like fish in water, and we hate every manifestation of truth that we are exposed to by nature. What's interesting, though, is that as the revelation of truth cranks up, so does our manifestation of our hostility to that truth. Hostility rises as truth shines more and more brightly. Here comes Jesus Christ, the Son of God incarnate, speaking truth, living truth, emulating truth, and just by his sheer presence, he cannot help but provoke and polarize the issue. This is exactly what John records in John chapter 3, verses 9 to 21. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. I don't know why, but when I read that verse, <laughs> the imagery that comes to mind is a, a cockroach. You flip on the light. If there's a cockroach you're out in the shed or something, there's some, some, some bugs out there. You flip on the light, right? And the, the cockroach is just scatter. It's like the light. It's like, oof, hide. And it's like, that's, that's the heart of mankind responding to a manifestation of truth. Truth starts shining. It starts exposing what's inside me that is really shameful, really wicked. And suddenly it's just, I got to get out of here. That's a natural reflex. I'm getting exposed. Hide. Light comes into the world. Men love the darkness rather than the light. So what happens? They're not neutral about the light. They hate the light. There's no neutrality when it comes to the light. And the brighter it shines, the more sharp the response. To benefit from this story as Mark presents it, we need to remember this is the climax of these controversy stories you notice that uh, Jesus does not back down from their hostility, but he actually provokes the manifestation of their hostility so that they themselves can see it. And in fact, the entire nation can see it as they go about for the next few years plotting his murder. But this is the greatest act of mercy that Jesus could demonstrate to those who are not willing to show mercy to anyone else. He is exposing their hostility. He's provoking their sin. He's, he's manifesting their self-worship, their love of preeminence before it's too late. The truth has this effect, my friends. Jesus Christ in this story is doing what the written word is said to do in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. Namely, this is the only way that the dark recesses of our hearts could be exposed before it's too late. You will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single one of you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to be examined. And what you will find because of what Jesus will expose, you could not know left to yourself. You don't even have the ability to give objective evaluation of everything inside your own heart. The only way we could possibly see what resides within before the day of judgment is for the written word of God to expose and provoke and convict everything that is wayward about us. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What about you? so important that we ask that question, isn't it? I mean, this is a, this is a profound story, and we, we, we've got to benefit from this story. And let me just ask you, is, 
t- together, can we just ask that question? <laughs> How are we doing with this? Do we find exposure from the Word of God attractive? Do we want that? Do we want our sin to be exposed by the piercing, penetrating light of the truth? Do we hate the thought that there could still be remaining areas in our lives that need to be exposed by the truth? I do understand. I don't want to over-apply this story. This story is written about Pharisees who are categorically hostile to the truth. And we'll have plenty of time later through the rest of Mark chapter 1 through 8 to document the hardness of heart in believers in the disciples. And so I understand there's a radical difference. For the disciples, it's an issue, issue of degrees. For the Pharisees, it's a state. But I want to ask you a question. Maybe you don't even know what state you're in. Are you hiding in the darkness? Are you neglecting the word for fear of having your deeds exposed? Do you have a first love that you'd be ashamed of anyone else knowing? If not, what do you have to hide? If you have nothing to hide, why wouldn't you come to the light for further refinement? The truth will provoke, it will polarize, it will give you clarity. My concern would be particularly just knowing my own conversion and knowing how many years I sat in church, how many sermons did I sit under, how many Bible studies did I participate in, and in one case, as an unbeliever, teach And yet there are so many subtle ways that our heart has to stiff arm the beam of light so that we create a shadow over that aspect of our heart that we're so ashamed of getting exposed. Listen, whatever hardness of heart you might suffer from, it's it's worse than a withered hand. And and, and then here's your hope. For Christ to heal a withered hand, (laughs) once again, proves as he's been doing that he also has the power to heal a hardened heart heart. Come to the Word of God so that your, whatever's in there can be exposed before it's too late. There's only two ways to know what's in your heart. There's only two ways to see where hostility might remain in your heart, and that is on the day of judgment when it's too late, and you will see it, and Christ will see it, and it will be clear to you both, and right now through the ministry of the Word. Let's pray. Lord, we want to just bow our heads and ask you for help because this is a heavy text. It's a, uh, a powerful story, Lord, because it contains characters that we are no different than by nature. And if there's any difference between us and the Pharisees, it's your grace. And so, Lord, thank you for such a powerful story at the climax of all of this controversy, at the climax of the, of the hostility between false religion and true religion, to see how you so wisely, graciously, perfectly, with even indignation at how it was hurting the people in that religion, and yet grief and sorrow because of the personal plight of those in a false religion. Thank you for provoking, and thank you for polarizing the issue. Lord, I just pray that your word would do that in our hearts this morning, and it would do that for the rest of our lives. We, uh, we invite your scrutiny, we invite the polarization of truth to show us what we need to see, and this is why um, healthy sons and daughters long to see conviction where we can grow, because we long to get rid of anything that would be displeasing to you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for bringing pain and difficulty. Thank you for bringing trial. Thank you for provoking in our hearts what's what's actually there that we would never have seen without the truth. Lord, do not let up. Make us like your son, we pray. And if that's the prayer of our heart this morning, um, then this sermon will not have been vain. In your name we pray. Amen.